Summary of Copper Sun by Sharon Draper Amari, who is 15 years old, laughs while her younger brother Kwasi plays in a coconut tree. Kwasi makes fun of Amari by saying that her fiancé, Besa, is coming, and then he runs back to their town. Besa walks up to Amari and says hello, but then he says he's worried because he saw guys with light skin coming to the village. Amari tells her mother and her best friend ESI about this. Mother tells Amari that it's not civilized to judge people by how they look. As the white people and Ashanti warriors come, the village gets ready for a party. Amari thinks they look dangerous, but she gets busy getting ready, listens with joy to father's story about the ceremony, and likes the drumming. Then disaster happens, the white men start shooting, and the Ashanti soldiers beat women and children to death with clubs. Amari and Kwasi try to get away, but Ashanti catches Kwasi with a knife. They get hold of Amari. The Ashanti and the white men put Amari and the other young people from the town in chains and make them march. As time goes on, many people die. They finally get to a city on the coast. Once the white men separate the men from the women, they untie Amari and push her into a dark room. It smells like blood, sweat, and garbage. Later, a woman named AFI helps Amari get food. She tells Amari that she and she are slaves who will be sold and sent out to sea. Amari's kidnappers sell her, brand her, and put her in a pen on the beach over the next few days. After the slaves have eaten for two days, they are put into small boats and taken to a bigger ship at sea. When Amari sees Besa, she starts to cry. AFI tells her to forget about him. Then come the slave women. Sharks eat the two women who jump into the water. The sailors lead the women past the men, who are tightly packed on shelves, and lock the women in the hold. After hours, the women and children are brought up to the deck. No land is in sight. The trip is very scary. Even though a sailor named Bill teaches Amari English some nights, the women are raped every night by sailors. For exercise, the sailors also make the slaves dance every day. As Amari learns more English, she finds out that they are going somewhere called Carolina. She is surprised by how beautiful the land is when she first sees it. AFI tells her that she will be able to get through bad times if she looks for beauty in them. Besa finds Amari in the building near the water and tells her not to forget him. The slaves are then sent to Charlestown to be sold at an auction. Amari is scared and confused as white guys take off her clothes, tie her wrists and ankles, and put oil all over her. Polly, a white girl, is at the slave sale. She doesn't care because she doesn't like black people, so she reads her contract instead. Polly will work for Mr. Derby for 14 years, it says. Polly sees Mr. Derby by a slave girl named Amari, and she watches as Mr. Derby tries to pull Amari away from the older woman who is standing next to her. Polly isn't sure if black people have feelings or not. While Mr. Derby buys Amari, his son Clay comes with a slave named Noah who is well-dressed. Polly asks Clay why he hits Noah. Even though she doesn't like slaves, she doesn't think they should be hit. Clay says it's how he shows he cares, and he tells Polly that Mr. Derby might beat her if she keeps being so stubborn. When he gets back, Mr. Derby puts Polly in the back of the wagon and starts the long trip home. He tells Clay that Amari is his birthday present while they are driving. Since Amari is his, Clay decides to call her Mina. They talk about how white women should be treated with care, but black women are different, and having sex with them shows who's in charge. Polly is shocked and upset when Mr. Derby tells her it's her job to civilize Amari when they get to the farm. She thought she would work at the house and learn how to be a lady, but she's stuck in a slave shack instead. Amari and Polly meet Teeny, the slave cook, her son Tidbit, and Tidbit's dog Hushpuppy. Polly's father was a slave, and both he and Polly's mother died of smallpox. Teeny feeds the girls and listens to Polly's story. Polly's contract is twice as long as normal because she has to pay off the debts of her parents. Teeny tells Polly that she will be free one day. That night, Clay calls Amari. Over the next few months, he calls her a lot. He makes Amari angry. 
Amari is learning English and helping Tini in the kitchen at the same time. Tini's mother was born in Africa. One day, she calms Amari by telling her that as long as she remembers Africa and her parents, they will never be gone. Amari asks Tini if she has any drugs that could kill her after a particularly bad night with Clay. Tini is adamant that Amari must live, and she shows her the Kent cloth that Tini's mother brought back from Africa. A week later, Amari and Polly talk about what they've lost while Amari, Polly, and Tidbit pick peaches for a pie. Mr. Derby's second wife, Mrs. Derby, is beautiful, kind, and pregnant. She goes to Teenie's kitchen every day to plan meals, but Teenie always cooks whatever she wants. Mrs. Derby feels sorry for Amari, and at one point, she even apologizes for Clay's actions. Amari hears Teenie and a house slave named Lena talk about Mrs. Derby. Lena thinks Mrs. Derby's life is perfect, but Teenie says that she is almost a slave because Mr. Derby has so much power over her. Mr. Derby married her because she is young, rich, and she brought land with her. Polly, on the other hand, never stops wanting to work in the house. As Amari gets settled in, Polly realizes that this might happen soon. Polly, Amari, and Tidbit are sent by Teeny to the rice fields to bring food and drink to the slaves who work there. Kato, the oldest slave on the farm, says that Amari will work in the rice fields as soon as Clay gets tired of her. Tidbit will also work in the fields when he is old enough. Because of snakes, alligators, malaria, and cholera, slaves rarely live more than five years in the fields. Polly and Amari are both shocked. A woman named Hildy screams at that moment because a snake bit her. She is pulled to dry land by other slaves, but they have to go back to work. She will die before nighttime. Back in the kitchen, Tini says she has an idea to keep Amari out of the fields, one of the house slaves is Hildy's daughter, and Amari and Polly will take her place at dinner. Polly is over the moon. As dinner progresses, Polly sees that Mrs. Derby is deeply unhappy and powerless. Amari is bringing a pie home from dinner when Mr. Derby trips her. The pie gets spread all over the floor. He beats Amari until Mrs. Derby tells him to stop, and it takes Amari three weeks to get over it. She is cared for by Polly, Teeny, and Mrs. Derby. When she feels better, she tries to stay out of sight in the kitchen. After the mess in the dining room, Mr. Derby told her she had to go work in the fields. She feels like her spirit is dead. Even worse, one afternoon Clay comes into the kitchen to get Tidbit so he can use him as alligator bait. So he can show her off to his friends, he makes Amari come. Amari can't believe how mean they are. After a few weeks, Mr. Derby comes running into the kitchen. He can't find any of the house slaves, and Mrs. Derby is about to give birth. He runs to the nearby farm and sends Amari and Polly to help his wife. Amari gives birth to Mrs. Derby's baby without any trouble, but the baby is black. Mrs. Derby begs the girls to save her baby. She thinks that her husband is going to kill her, the baby, and Noah, the father of the baby. They give the baby to a slave woman called Sarah Jane with the help of Teeny. Even though they tell Mr. Derby that the baby died at birth, he insists that the body needs to be examined by the doctor who is on his way. Polly runs to meet Noah and Dr. Hoskins on the road, but Dr. Hoskins won't turn around. When he gets there, Mr. Derby realizes that his slaves and his wife are hiding something. Dr. Hoskins and Mr. Derby are inside when Teeny tells Noah the news. Noah tells Dr. Hoskins and Mr. Derby that he loves Mrs. Derby. Clay comes in with the baby just as Mr. Derby is dragging Mrs. Derby out of the house. He makes her watch while he shoots Noah and the baby. Then, he locks Amari, Polly, Teeny, and Tidbit in the smokehouse and tells the girls and Tidbit that he is selling them. Cato tells the slaves that Dr. Hoskins doesn't believe in slavery that night. He'll let them get away and then they should head south to Fort Mose. He follows Teeny's instructions to poison Clay and make him ill so that he can't join the doctor. Teeny gives Tidbit her mother's Kent cloth and wails as the wagon pulls out. She gets hit by Mr. Derby. Dr. Hoskins says he's embarrassed when they're still an hour away from the farm. 
he sends Amari, Polly, and Tidbit into the woods with food, money, and a gun. Hushpuppy catches up with them quickly. They work hard day and night for a few days, but they have to stop when Amari picks fruits that make them sick. Amari is worried about her because she doesn't seem to be getting over what happened. She feels sick and dizzy. Amari will sometimes catch fish or find crayfish in the rivers they cross. Tidbit cries one night because Hushpuppy is gone. When it starts to rain, they find a cave and make a fire late at night. When the girls see an animal outside, they are scared, but it turns out to be Hushpuppy with a fat rabbit. A few days later, Clay grabs Amari by the hand. He ties her up and tells her that his father has died. Then he thinks about how to punish her for trying to get away. Clay is knocked out when Polly shoots him in the head. The bullet just misses his temple. When Clay wakes up, the girls have tied him up, and when he looks around, he sees a rattlesnake. They don't do anything to help him. After that, they meet a boy named Nathan not long after. He makes sure Fort Mose is real and hides them in his father's barn. When Nathan's father finds them, Amari, Polly, and Tidbit have to hide in a swamp. Soon after that, a woman named Fiona finds them in the hunting cave her husband built for them. Even though she has slaves and thinks slavery is fine, she is happy to be able to make her own choice for once and has one of her slaves hook up a wagon for the runaways. Besa is the slave, but he has lost his energy. He won't let Amari touch him, and he says that he no longer has thoughts. A few days after that, they meet a Spanish soldier. Even though he acts like he believes Polly's story that she's going home to her father, he tells them important things about Fort Mose and how to cross the river into Spanish Florida. Not long after that, they get to the river and ride the horse across. After sleeping for a night, they ride to Fort Mose. Tidbit still misses Teeny, but he asks Amari to be his mother now. Amari agrees. A woman named Inez feeds the runaways on the edge of the city. She also tells them they are safe and shows them to Captain Menendez. He is an escaped slave, and he chooses that Amari will weave and Polly will teach children to read. Inez shows Amari where she'll live by taking her there. They talk about how hard it is to be a slave, and Inez asks Amari how he has been feeling. Inez says that Amari is not sick because she is expecting a baby. Amari is upset, but Inez keeps telling her that she loves her baby already and needs to tell her all her stories. She doesn't bother Amari. Amari says she will never think about Clay again, and she realizes that her baby has the spirits of her mother, her father, Kwasi, and all the people from her town who were killed. When she looks at the red sun, she feels like she's back where she belongs. About the author. Draper was born in Cleveland, Ohio. He was the first of three children. She read a lot as a child. By the time she was 11, she had read almost every book in the children's area of her library. She got her bachelor's degree in English from Pepperdine University, and then she went to Miami University of Ohio to get her master's degree in English. When she was done with school, she started teaching high school in Cincinnati. In 1990, one of her students dared her to write something on her own. The short story that came out of this was called One Small Torch, and it won an Ebony Magazine writing contest. After 10 years, Draper gave up teaching to focus on writing. She has won awards for both teaching and writing over the course of her work. She has won five Coretta Scott King Book Awards, including one for Copper Sun, and several of her books have been named ALA Best Books. Several of her books have also won awards in their own towns and regions. Many of Draper's books are about what black Americans go through or about racial issues in the U.S. as a whole. Hope we summarized it fully and you liked it. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that we are motivated to create more videos.